So welcome, all of you. Thanks for braving the cold um, and for all the rescheduling, but happy you're here. Um, our guest speaker today is Jaime Arredondo, whose exhibition, Popol Vuh, the Sacred Book of the Quiche through Illustration, is currently on display at our sister facility, the Irving Archives and Museum near downtown. <clears throat> Uh, and Jaime will be speaking about the project um, extensively, uh, all the illustrations for Popol Vuh. A little bit about Jaime. He has very long, well-established, deep roots with Irving. Uh, he was born in Dallas, Texas, to Mexican-American Tejano parents. He is a graduate of MacArthur High School, just across the road from us, as well as University of Dallas, also a little bit further down the road, where he received his B.A., uh, after graduating from Yale University with his MFA in painting, he moved to New York City where he resides to this day. He works and lives there. He has had numerous solo gallery and museum shows in the Southwest and in New York City and is the recipient of numerous awards. In 2009, his paintings were published as stamps by the United Nations, and in 2015, he was commissioned to create a permanent art project for the Manhattan Transit Authority, the MTA, comprised of 36 mosaics of his works that are installed in a, a station in the Bronx. Also in 2015, the Irving Art Center mounted a one-person exhibition for uh, Jaime, spotlighting his large-scale floral paintings. Uh, the show was entitled The Garden of <coughs> Earthly Delights, Paintings by Jaime Arredondo. And after its premiere here in Irving, I'm happy to say that the exhibition did travel to the uh, Emma S. Barentios Mexican American Cultural Center in Austin, and then the Maybe Garer Museum of Art in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Um, and I'm also happy to say that Jaime's uh, illustrations, the 65 illustrations for Popol Vuh, that project will also be touring nationally through Exhibits USA. So that's very exciting. Um, Jaime has taught at NYU, the Parsons School of Design, the Pratt Institute, and the New School, where he continues to teach a course on Mesoamerican art and culture. And as I mentioned, he, continue, he currently lives in New York City with his uh, wife and daughter. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jaime this afternoon. Thank you so much. And um, after he, sorry to, for that delay, but after he gives his presentation and does his, de his demo, we will have Q&A, or it might be interspersed throughout. But please uh, remember, I do have this a microphone that we need for the recording. So raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you so we can capture your questions and comments for the recording. Um, we do have some of his postcards for the Popol Vuh exhibition, which is up through February 4th at the Irving Archives and Museum. You can find those on the table over there, as well as some really fun little stickers featuring one of the illustrations. And we also have our January-February rack card for the, all the exhibits here at the Arts Center. So you might want to grab one of those. Okay. Uh, again, without further ado, please help me welcome. Oh, I already have the microphone. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, I came in on Sunday at the airport, and uh, it was 12 degrees, and it was, the wind was blowing, and I had to get my rental car, and it was so extremely cold. And uh, I called my wife back, and I said, it's so cold, I want to go back to New York City where it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's feeling better today. So uh, thank God, uh, because that was cold. That was a cold I had not experienced in a long time. Um, the show comes down at Irving Archives and Museum, uh, the Popol Vuh, uh, the sacred text of the Popol Vuh by the Kiche Mind through illustration by me, uh, the 65 illustrations, coming down February 4th. So please tell everyone about it. I'm going to be giving a tour tomorrow at 2 o'clock. It's the last tour that I give of the show. I won't be back again. So on Sunday morning, I leave for New York City. So please come out for the tour. Tell all your friends. It's a wonderful exhibition. The illustrations themselves took 10 years to do. What I'm going to show you took 10 years to do. Uh, and as I was doing these flower paintings that Marcy was talking about, I was doing this at the same time. The show itself took two years to do. 
after you know, doing this body of work of Pope Vu, I realized, I stepped back and I said, I realized that there's a large body of work here that is really unique and unprecedented in many ways because no one has illustrated this Popol Vu, the sacred text of the of the Quiche Mayan, ever before. There have been 10, there's been 12. Diego Rivera did about 10, 12 illustrations, but not to the extent of 65 illustrations that trace the story chronologically from beginning to end. Someone named Alan Christensen created a two-volume set on the Popol Vu. He teaches at Brigham Young University. It took him 20 years to create that two-volume set. Most people won't walk around with a two-volume set. I read it. It's an incredible achievement, incredible work on the, on the Popol Vu. But you can come and see my 65 illustrations at Irving Archives and Museum, and you can pretty much understand, even with the presentation I'm going to make with you today, most of the story. And I dem so, in other words, what I did was I democratized it. I democratized the Popol Vuh uh, by creating illustrations. I made it accessible to everyone, and, uh, so, and that was one of my intentions to do that. And in the process, I created a sacred text of a sacred text that was burned long ago. Let me give you an overview of the story of the Popol Vuh. By the way, there's several stories here. There's my story, you know, coming from Irving, going to University of Dallas and going to Yale and then going, to, going to New York City and, City and living there. Then there's the story of what happened to the Popol Vuh, and then there's the story of the Popol Vuh itself. Well, let's get an overview of the Popol Vuh. So there were these frag, we know it as the oldest body of literature in the Americas. It's the first continuous story of the Americas. And what do I mean by that? There were fragments of mythology throughout Mesoamerica going all the way back to about 1200 BC. One of the earliest, some of the earliest sculptures by the Olmecs go all the way back 1200 BC by the Olmecs in Veracruz. Um, so, and we see references to what I'm going to show you today that go all the way back 1200 BC. If you had looked, gone to the Maya show at the Kimball Museum, you would have seen one of the things that I'm going to point out in, this, in the illustrations that go all the way back to 300 BC. There was a stela, meaning a flat sculpture, in the show at the Kimball Museum of the Mayan, Mayan art that goes all the way back to 300 BC. So there are fragments of mythology out there floating around Mesoamerica. The Quiche Maya, Mayan Quiche, come in 1000 AD, a highland Mayan uh, community or people, and they took all of these fragments of mythology and put them into this long, one long continuous story. Okay, that was 1000 AD. They wrote it, rather told the story, not by words, nor orally, but by pictographs. So that book, we think, had been surviving, had survived since 1000 AD until the Spaniards came in 1524 and burned it. We think this is what happened, as far as we know, to this text that was written in 1000 AD. A very elite group of Quiche Mayan learned Latin through the new Catholic universities that were created in Guatemala and learned Latin and they retold the story through Latin script secretly. They didn't want the Spaniards to know that they were doing it. The Spaniards were saying, look, don't tell this, this story anymore. It's pagan. It's satanic. They took that text and hid it for 150 years until Father Jimenez, a Dominican priest, comes and translates the text. They show him the, the Latin version, and they tell him the story orally by memory. And he translates the text, Spanish on one side of the page and Quiche on the other. And then he takes that translated text in 1701, that was 1701, hides it in the basement of the church of Chichicastenango, in Chichicastenango, Guatemala. And it stays there for 150 years until a French priest comes and steals the book, takes it to Paris with the hopes of selling it. That's in 1855. He dies. But a multimillionaire from Chicago, Edward Ayer, finds out about this large cachet, you know, of things that, not only the Popol Vuh, but other things, and he said, yeah, I'll buy all of it. And I'll, he takes it, takes it back to Chicago, not knowing, he didn't know that in one of the cases was this translated text by Father Jimenez that was stolen out of the country. 
He takes it and donates it to the University of Chicago. He's from Chicago. The people of Guatemala, and, and one of the one man that was running for president, Adriano Recinos, says, you know, that's part of our heritage. Where is it? So they traced it down and found it was in Chicago. They wouldn't release it. Still to this day, University of Chicago has it. And they, but they were able to translate the text into English. I took that exact text, the first translated version of Popol Vuh, and I said, you know, this is an incredible story. I want to learn about it. I want to teach my students at NYU and the New School this story. It takes me about three to four years. I took it around 2005, started reading it. it took me three, four, or five years before I even introduced it to my classes. And when I did, I realized I had to illustrate the story to help my students. So what you're seeing are illustrations that I've shown my students that after 10 years took me to, you know, to do, well, uh, illustrate all the 65 illustrations. And I realized I had done something incredible. I had basically, as I said before, created a sacred text of the sacred text that was burned long ago, forgotten and burned long ago. When I made the first presentation, at the Irving Archives and Museum, the Guatemalan consulate was there. And they were so happy. It almost brought me to tears. And they kept saying, Maestro Arredondo, thank you so much for bringing this story of the Mayan Quiche back to the public and letting people know about it. And they knew, they shook their heads and knew who Adriano Recinos was. He ran for president in 1950, and his grandson is now still active in in uh, translating texts uh, and you know other things uh, uh, in Guatemala. This is a sacred text that could be put up there with other world bodies of literature, in my view. There's, there's the Odyssey, Epic of Gilgamesh, Iliad, Dante's Inferno. It's up there. One of the things that I found out that occurs within this story, like all great bodies of literature, is the four archetypal features that are found in all bodies of literature. They are the archetypal hero. Everyone's going to be a hero at some point, or you're going to know someone that's been a hero and needs to be a hero. There's the archetypal journey. You're going to go on a journey, either physical or psychological or internal some way. You're going to have to go through a journey. And then there's the archetypal underworld. In this case, Shibalba in which two of the hero twins have to go down into the underworld, Shibaba, in order to save us, play ball with the lords of the underworld, defeat them, and create the universe. And then there's the archetypal message. What did you learn from having gone on this journey, having become a hero, and having gone into the underworld? What's the message? What did you bring back? What lesson did you learn to bring back to the community, and to yourself, and to your family. Those four archetypal features are found in all great bodies of literature. Even in Joseph Conrad, you know, uh, and, and what is it called? Um, Joseph, uh, Heart of Darkness, Apocalypse Now. And I found it, I haven't watched Barbie, but I <laughs> found, I, someone told me that see, these things are even found in, in the movie Barbie. I have to see it. <laughs> Let me start with the uh, tour, so to speak, uh, of the images. In the beginning, <clears throat> there was nothing. And then it says, Tepu Guku Max. Now, you see, this is what made the text so difficult. First, there were very few texts about the story to guide me. That's why it took me 10 years. I had to go up to the museums and libraries and do my own research to find out how to create these illustrations. So, you probably heard that sentence before in the beginning, there's nothing. That's Genesis, correct? Old Testament. Remember, Father Jimenez was translating this text. And he probably said, dude, the first sentence of the most, the best story, the most famous story in the world is Old Testament Genesis. You got to start out with this sentence. So they, the Kiche probably said, yeah, you're right. Let's start out with that. In the beginning, there was nothing. Iberian Catholicism. But if you notice, there's the word gukumats. Gukumats in Kiche means feathered serpent. Well, where does this concept of feather serpent come from? In the north of Mesoamerica, where Mexico City is and, all, and goes almost as far as the Texas border, is the Mexican region. 
and in the south is Mayan. So this feathered serpent, otherwise known as Quetzalcoatl, is a Mexican mythological feature or invention. Feathered serpent, well wait a minute, how did it end up with the Quiche way down in the Mayan territory? His legend went all the way down there. And that's where they said there were these two twin spirits or two people. There's Tipu, our Lord, our Prince, and together there's the feathered serpent there. So here's Mexican with Mayan, Iberian Catholicism. All mixed in with, within this one text. It's a very American thing to bring all these different things together. Okay, let's go to the next one. Then they created the three hearts of heaven, or otherwise known as huracanes, or hurricanes. Hurricane is something powerful, it's godlike, it's omnipresent, it's everywhere. So they said, there's the three hearts of heaven, or huracanes. Then the gods created the small animals. As my daughter, she was born at, around that time, and she was sleeping right next to me as I was doing these illustrations. So I was thinking of her as I was doing many of these illustrations. So I was thinking, how is she going to think about this? Um, later, if she sees this, and uh, so I created these small animals, sort of for her. Then the gods created the first generation of men, the men made of mud, but they had no brains, and every time it rained, they dissolved. <laughs> then they created the men of wood, but they had no brains either, and they walked around sort of like bumping into each other. They were very robotic, stiff. Then they made men out of red bean. There's a real tree that gives forth red beans, and they use it for dye to this day, to paint clothes and other things, and to use it for magical events, powers, shamanic power or shamanic events. So they made the men of red bean. But the gods didn't like them because they had no brains. They couldn't revere the gods, so they... The gods sent the chihuahuas and the pots and pans to destroy them. J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, said her top five bodies of literature that influenced her was the Popol Vuh. So I read. But, I mean, it almost makes sense because there's several moments in the story that are very Harry Potter-like. This is one of them. Then they go into the jungle and they're turned into monkeys. And so that's why we have jungle uh, monkeys to this day. And they're gone forever, these uh, first three men. Every story needs a bad dude. And this is the bad dude. He's part man, he's part macaw. And his name is Vuku, Vuku Kakish, which means seven macaw. It's a Mayan calendar date. We don't know what it really means to this day. But that's his real translated name. It's seven macaw. He is like, if you've ever seen a macaw, they're very loud, they screech and they preen around and they think they're the most beautiful birds in the world and it very much fits his personality because he says, my teeth are made of pearl, my eyes are made of diamond. There is no sun, no moon or stars and when I smile and open my eyes, it's as if the sun and the stars shine above. All men will follow me because I'm the wealthiest, I'm the most intelligent person in the world and I have two sons just like me. So the God said, look, we can't have this dude around. This is a bad example. We need to get rid of him. So they create the hero twins. So these are the two hero twins that I referred to. Hunapu on the left and Shibalanke on the right. Hunter on the left, Jaguar on the right. And that's why he has a Jaguar print or tattoo on his left shoulder. They join forces. And they, their first cosmic duty, the gods tell them, kill this Vukub Kakish and kill his two sons afterwards. So they know that he loves to eat Nazis every morning at the top of the tree. You can still get Nazis today. They're these little yellow kind of shriveled up berries and put salt and pepper on, you know, chili on top. And they know, this is one of my favorite compositions. This is very difficult. How am I going to like arrange this figure in the tree, eating Nazis, and then show the, the hero twins on the bottom? As you can see, Huna Poob hits him in the jaw with his blowgun. <laughs> this really silent, lethal implement. You know, these huge, long blowguns. Hits him in the jaw, 
breaks his jaw, he falls down and rips off the right arm, right arm of Hunapu. Who do we see on the stela? What do we see dated 300 BC at the Mayan show at the Kemble Museum? This dude, Vukub Kakish, on the top of the tree with a hero twin shooting him in the jaw, just as you see here, 300 BC. And that's what I mean. There were fragments of the story all throughout Mesoamerica, but the Quiche Mayan brought all these together and they created this one long narrative. And that's why it's known as the oldest story of the Americas, as far as we know. Maybe there's something out there we don't know about. We don't know because the Spaniards burned many of the codices that were mostly created by the Mayans. <clears throat> to this day, there's only 11 codices that exist in all the world. One's named the Paris Codice, the other one's named the Dresden Codice, the other one's the Milan Codice, etc. because they, they took them out of Guatemala and they took them all throughout the world. So 11 of all the thousands of codices, can you imagine? Only 11 exist. So anyway, they hit him in the jaw, and now he took him to his home. Now they got to get to get the right arm and kill Vuku Kakish. So they're able to disguise themselves as orphans. They get into his home. They blind his eyes with sticking a large cactus needle into the pupil of his eyes. And they take out of his teeth, and they replace him with corn kernels. <clears throat> and slowly... He loses his beauty and dies. They accomplished their first cosmic duty. They killed Vukub Kakish. Now you see the way his hands are? You see that? That is based on a little statuette that from my research and others as well, that was, cook, cook, uh, he is making their pits in his eyes and he's like this in pain. That's the moment that the hero twins kill Vuku Kakish. So I based it on that little statuette. So I did my homework. I went all around the museums to see how I could create these illustrations. Now they got to kill. See Pagna, his son, that walks around with big mountains on his back. He talks like that because he's a big giant. And he sees these 400 boys building a cabin. He says, can I help you build this cabin, this log house? Yeah, sure. Go down into the hole and we'll tell you to get out. And, then, and he overhears them. They're going to put a big log, drop a big log down there in order to kill him. So he digs the side hole and they throw the big log. He survives, but he rips out his fingernail. He rips out his hair and takes out one of his tooth and he gives it to the pincher ants to show, to go up to the surface to show them, the foreigner boys, that he has died and his body is decomposing. He survives. So he comes up and he forces the house right on top of them and kills them. This is a beautiful cosmological moment because what happens here is they rise up to become the Milky Way, the 400 boys. And we see this often in the Mexican mythology in the North. So it repeats itself in different parts of Mesoamerica, over and over, it's always 400 boys. <clears throat> now they got to kill him. So the hero twins know that he loves red crabs. Everyone knows about the poinsettia bush, right, that you put out for Christmas. I found out through my research that the poinsettia is actually indigenous to southern Mexico and Guatemala. It's an indigenous plant. I always thought it was European. Right? Because it's associated with Christmas. It has to be European, right? No! It's indigenous to that area. And it's used for medicinal uh, properties or uses. For its medicinal properties. So the, uh, the hero twins get the leaves. They make a fake crab. They tell him, Zipagna, that there's a, they know that he loves red crabs. And so he goes down there and he says, look, there's a big river in the ravine. Look, there's red crab down there. Go get it. He says, okay, I'm going to go get it to eat it. And while he's down there, they force all the boulders on top of him and kill him. So now they've killed the first son. The second son, they know that he loves doves. So they poison a dove. They give it to him. They po he trembles, begin to poison from all the poison. They wrap, you know, they bind his arms and his ankles. And now the hero twins have killed both sons and Vuku Kakish. And they celebrate by um, uh, there in the sun, in the sunset. Now I'm on to part two. 
the, the story is circular. So what happens is the hero twins leave the story and here come the father on the left and the uncle on the right of the hero twins. They're always followed by these two messenger owls, one with no head, the other with only one foot. Another very Harry Potter kind of uh, feature. <clears throat> and the gods say, look, who's up there playing ball up there? You know, they knock on the surf. Who's up there? Tell them to come down here and play ball with us. So they go down into the underworld, into Shibaba for the first time. It wasn't the hero twins that first went. It's the father and the uncle. And they come to some crossroads in a river of blood. I made it look the river of blood as curtains. But they come to the crossroads and they say, we have to choose a road in order to get to the lords of the underworld and defeat them. But the lords of the underworld say, yeah, okay, you chose the right road, but we're going to put you through five houses of torture, and we're going to give you a cigar and copal incense, and you make sure you have both of those lit, or we're going to kill you. So here's the first house of torture, the house of gloom. If you notice, the roof has this rattlesnakes on it. The house of cold. That's the way I felt on Sunday when I first <laughs> arrived at DFW. <clears throat> the House of Jaguars. The House of Vampire Bats. They, you know, they chose these most incredible creatures that, and I'm going to show you this in just a moment, that are transformative. Vampire bats transform themselves. Jaguars transform themselves. They can, you know, stay right there on the trail, right? You know, be right there on the trail as you're walking down the jungle. You'll never see them. They have this beautiful camouflaged coat. Transformative creatures. Now here's the House of Knives. So they're able to survive all of that, but they didn't come back with a cigar and copal incense lit. So they kill one brother by taking out his heart, and they cut off the head of Hun Hunapu, the father of the hero twins. And they tie it up onto a tree that grows in the underworld. And the tree shimmers and glows, and the skull talks. And one of the princesses of the underworld, Little Pinprick of Blood, that's her name, Shikik. Her father is known as Big Puddle of Blood, Kuchumakik, one of the principal lords of the underworld. She says, Daddy, I gotta go see the skull. It talks. I gotta go see it. Don't go, daughter. Don't go. Nothing good will come from it. But what happens, like all daughters, what all daughters do? She goes. She sneaks out, and she goes through the underworld for nine months. So, you know, there's another name for her, and that's Blood Moon. Blood, blood, and then nine months. I think you all understand what this relates to, right? She's having her first menstru menstruation period, and she's become a woman. So when she approaches the head, the head says, you are now a woman. You're no longer a girl. You're now a woman. Stick out your right hand. I have a gift to give you. She sticks out her right hand, and poof, he spits into it, and she gets pregnant. But who does she get pregnant with? Can you tell me? Who do you think? The hero twins. <laughs> so they come back into the story. She goes and tells her father, father, I'm sorry? This is a prequel, yes. So she comes back, she's pregnant, and she tells her father, father, I know you told me not to go see the skull, but I went and saw the skull, he spit in my hand, and poof, I got pregnant. Liar, you've been going out with boys that we don't know about. Take her, messenger owls, and take her heart out. Bring her heart back. We'll burn it and bring honor back to our family. She convinces the owls to not go there. There's a tree that actually gives red sap, and we can take it, dry it, and form it into a human heart. And they go and do that. And they bring the heart back, put it on the fire, and the Lord of the Underworld smell it and say, yes, we have brought honor back to our family. And you see the portrait of her, her little portrait there of Shikik. She's pregnant, and she comes up to our world terrestrial world, and she tells Shimu Kane, cosmic grandmother, otherwise known as double grandmother, because, you know, grandmothers, are, it's not enough just to have one grandmother. You've got to have two grandmothers and one. They're very important. And she says, grandmother, I have within my belly 
your grandchildren, because you know her, her son was Hun Hunapu, the father, and the other son was Vuku Hunapu, the ones that were killed by the lords of Shibalba. Liar! My, my two sons are dead. There's no way that you could have uh, ha had relationships with my son and have the, the children. And by the way, does anyone know La Virgen de Guadalupe? You know, ever seen the, with the, that's where I got this idea. Anyway, she says, go make yourself useful. If you want to be a good daughter-in-law, go make yourself useful. Useful. Go get, bring me some corn. And she pulls one string from one corn, and thousands of corn appear. So this is on the card, I think, one of the cards that you see. It's a beautiful moment. It's this beautiful cosmological moment of the creation of corn. But all this happens, you know, in the underworld, Shibalba. Then she has her children in the hawk position, which from what I understand is the, the more, uh, let's see, often used until recently position to have children. I, had, I talked to a midwife on the way here who teaches at, at NYU, and we talked about this endlessly, about the hawk position. Anyway, there are these two monkey brothers, known as the, their stepbrothers, but they're known as the monkey brothers that had been born before. And these two half-brothers, stepbrothers, ate the hero twin. So when they were born, they put one of them on a hill of thorns. Let the thorns bleed them to death. But they survive it. Then they put them on a hill of ants. Let the ants consume them. But they survive it. God, we just can't get rid of these guys. Okay, let's go hunting for birds. They all agree. All four of them. So there's a bird that one of the hero twins shot and is trapped way up in the tree. And the, and they tell the monkey brothers, go up and get the bird. And as they go up, the tree goes higher and higher and taller and taller. And the monkey brother says, we're so high up on the you know, tree. How do we get down? Don't worry. Let go of your loincloth. And the loincloths form into monkey tails. And they become monkeys. And that's why they're called the monkey brothers. They come back to dance the monkey dance in front of Shimukane, double grandmother. And she thinks it's so funny, and, uh, and then they go into the jungle and disappear as, jung as monkeys, and that's why we have monkeys today. They defeat their own brothers. Okay, what happens <clears throat> next? Well, the he just as like as the father and uncle did, and the, and the you know, Lord your Baba down there uh, hear them, and they you know, knock, knock on the surface above, who's that? Playing ball up there. And it's the hero twins. And they send a flea to send a message to the hero twins that they should come in seven days to play ball with them. So they send the flea, but the flea is eaten by the frog, and the frog is eaten by the snake, and the snake is eaten by the hawk. So when the hawk flies over the ball court where they're playing ball, they hit the hawk with their blowgun, and the hawk vomits the snake, and the snake vomits the frog, and the frog vomits the flea. And the flea comes out and says, come play ball with the lords of the underworld in seven days with a tiny little voice. I had to figure out, how am I going to put all of these actions in this one panel? And that's how I did it. Are you liking these illustrations so far? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I worked so hard on them. Ten years I spent. They tell their grandmother, grandmother, we're going down into the underworld. Grow these reeds in the middle of the house. As long as they're alive, we're alive. When they die, we die. I found out that in Guatemala, still around springtime, they grow reeds in the middle of their house to commemorate this one event. It's incredible. They go down into the underworld, but they don't want to be tricked by the lords of the underworld just as they had done to their father and their uncle. So they send mosquitoes, huge mosquitoes, to bite them. And if you've ever gone down to which I have, Guatemala hunters, there are big mosquitoes, and they hurt. You can feel it when they sting you. So each one felt like, ah, is that you, Patan? You know, they were each announcing their names. Is that you, Shulu? And they would now, is that you, Kuchumakik? They thought each one was pinching the, their legs, but it was just a mosquito. And in this way, they learned their names. And then they said, okay, look, let's play, let's be friends, let's play ball. So the hero twins right away, get a ball, put the ball through the ring, and I made it into a snake. It's a, it forms into a skull at the end. And the dude, you see they're, they're in the middle, one of the lords of the, of the underworld, wants to cut off their heads as if they anticipated they're going to be losers. 
the losers of the ball games. Ball games were so important in Mesoamerica that the losers' heads would be cut off by the winners and then hung from the back of their belt and paraded around. You know, it was kind of like a, an event that would happen after the ball game. That is a sompantli on the left. Afterwards, they would take the head and skewer it and then put it on a rack like that. So if you go and do your research, you'll see commemorative skull racks with um, cement skulls instead of the real skulls to commemorate this, the sompantli, the skull rack. That's a real knife, sacrificial knife that I found in one of the museums. So I copied it just like that. I did my research on this. <clears throat> So the lords of the Balba said, Shababa said, look, okay, let's, let's be friends now. Get us some flowers. So there's a special garden in the underworld that grows flowers. And as you can see, the arms, those are like, were branches. And I, I love this. When you, make, you can make these artistic decisions as the artist, they form the branches. The messenger owls are guarding over the um, garden. And they send the, the hero twins send the ants to cut the flowers and they, and they fall asleep. The messengers are fall asleep. They don't know what's happening. So they bring them back and they put them in gourds to bring to the Lord to the underworld. How could you have done this? And they get angry at the, at the owls for having fallen asleep and allowed the, the pencher ants to cut the flowers and bring the flowers to the Lord to the underworld. Okay, let's be friends again. Let's, I'm gonna, we're going to put you in the three houses of torture, I mean five houses of torture, torture just like we did to your parents and I combined them all in this one panel. So House of Cold, Jaguars, and Fire. Uh, and the final house is the House of Vampire bat, Bats, Kamazots. Well, I'm going to talk to you about him in just a moment. They crawl into their blowguns, and one of them sticks his head out, Hunapu, in fact, asks his brother, Shibalanke, is the sun, has the sun come up enough so that the vampire bats will disappear? And he says, yeah, I think so. It wasn't up high enough. And one vampire bat swoops down and cuts off the head of Hunapu. A turtle comes along. And they said, look, my brother doesn't have a head anymore. So they get the turtle and they put it in place of his head. So now he's walking around with a turtle that talks in place of his head. And they, got it, they still got to play ball with the lords of the underworld. So they use his head, as you see there, to play ball with the lords of the underworld. Then they get the head back, and they put it back on his body. So Hunapu, this is the same one that lost his right arm, and now he lost his head. And then they play ball with his head, but it gets uh, his head back. <clears throat> then they tell the lords of the underworld, say, look, we know you want to kill us. We're going to devise our own death, and we're going to throw ourselves in a bonfire. This mythological event occurs many times throughout Mesoamerica. It happens with the Mexicans, it happens with the Mayans. <coughs> People throw themselves into fires. Quetzalcoatl, the feather serpent from Mexico in the Mexican region, throws himself in fire, and, uh, in a bonfire, and he rises up to become Venus, the morning star. And he becomes evening star, so white star in the north, dark star in the south. They come back as old fishermen that perform miracles. They can cut up people and put houses on fire, bring the house back and bring the dismembered people back to life. You see there? Even chihuahuas. They cut them up and bring them back to life. They're miracle workers. <clears throat> the Lords of Shibaba hear about this and say, can you cut up each other? Yeah, sure we can cut up each other. So they cut up each other. <laughs> they bring themselves back to life. Incredible! Can you do that to us? Sure, we can cut you up. So they cut all the gods up into pieces, but they don't bring them back to life. And this is how they defeat the lords of Shibalba. And they tell all the inhabitants to go. Leave Shibalba. Now, Orozco painted this very important mural at, in, at Dartmouth. And I use some of the elements in his mural. And I said, that was perfect because in that mural, he was talking about Quetzalcoatl telling the people of Tula for having followed Tezcatlipoca, the evil shaman, smoke and mirrors, to leave Tula. Quetzalcoatl, born in the year one reed, leaves Tula on the year one reed and then returns, supposedly, 500 years later 
when he's supposed to return 500 years later, instead, at a non Cortez returns on the year one read. And that becomes a different historical event. But it's when mythology and history come together. You want to know more, I can elaborate on that more. The hero twins, one rises up to become the sun, and the other one rises up to become the moon. That's a real Aztec glyph. You see that above it, above them? Sun on one side and moon on the other. Now I'm at part three. I'm almost done. They decide to create the first generation of men, real men. And if you had gone to that show, I keep referring to the show, it you know, was first the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and that's where I saw it. But there were these beautiful statuettes that were made of the corn goddess inside of a corn plant. Just like that. Those are little tender corn plants. Uh, and <clears throat> I decided to use them in this particular event where they create the first men. And they're all attributed to Jaguar, and that's why they have the Jaguar prints. On the left, you see it's Laughing Jaguar, <clears throat> the first man. The second one is Black Jaguar. The third Jaguar is Chili Jaguar. You know, like chili sauce? Chili Jaguar, and that's why he's red. And then the fourth one is Messed Up, Unkempt Jaguar. These first men saw too far, knew too much. They competed with the gods. So the gods blew mist into their eyes, and so that's what's happening here. Then they created the first four women, and I put them in the little tender corn stalks, just as before with the men, and they're all attributed to water. Water means fertility, abundance. So it's the water of the macaw on the left, falling wa uh, water or waterfall. The third one is beautiful water, and the fourth one is water of the hummingbird. But now there's all these crazy people in the jungles, in the forests. And so this is one of my creations of the crazy people. And you see the one in the middle? I actually took that from the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, the creation of God. Does anyone recognize it? He grabs his head. And, okay, look at it again. <laughs> and then Kamazots appears. There is a vase dated 500 AD with a part man, part vampire bat creature. And his name is Kamazots, otherwise known as Death Bat One. It's from one of the calendar dates. And he comes in and out of the story here as a messenger god. And uh, this is probably one of the creatures that, you know, Spanish said, he's a satanic figure, he's Satan. Don't read the story. But he helps to protect the lost fire, in which the Quiche have the only selected tribe to keep or take the lost fire. So he guards it. He spreads his wing like this. Very similar to the vase, the drawing on the vase from 500 AD. So that's what I was looking at as my source. It's there at the Museum of Natural History in New York City in Manhattan. The Quiche have on the lonely fire, the only lost fire in the world to keep them warm. And the other tribes say, look, we're so cold. Please share your fire. So they ask Kamazots and their new god, Tohil, what should we do when the other tribes come to tell us they need fire? Tell them to give you their armpits and their waists. What? What does, what could that mean? Their armpits and their waist. What do you think that means, Quentin? <clears throat> That's an odd thing to ask for, right? Armpits and waist. Well, there's, uh, when you talk about waist, I imagine uh, in urine. No, it's this waist. Oh, yes, yeah, this oh, waist. <clears throat> well, this is this is yeah. I'll ex yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to you. So the Aztecs, when they took out the hearts for human sacrifice, they went through the rib cage here, and then they opened the ribs because there's bone here, and then we took out the heart. The Mayans would make an incision here through the arm because there is no bone, and then they would stick their hand in and take out the heart, or go under the rib cage and their waists. Ah, oh, you see, yeah, this is why, see, you have to do all of this research to find out what's the difference between the Aztecs, how did the Aztecs do it, Who did, how did the Mayans do it? This is how the Mayans did it. So, what the gods were saying is, <clears throat> you the Quiche, you're the chosen one. You have the right to sacrifice all the other tribes. So when the tribes come to you, ask for fire, tell them that you can sacrifice them. Let them give up their armpits and wastes. And here's my version of the Quiche 
sacrificing the other tribes for that fire. I'm almost done. And then they begin to dance around the snake uh, mountain, uh, snake mountain. In, with the Aztecs, Chipichab, Cuatepec with the, with the Mexicans, there is a mythological moment in which the Aztec nation is born. And, they, and that happens on Snake Mountain, otherwise known as Cuatepec. This happens in Chipichab, that's the name, it translated Snake Mountain. What we think, it's, no, it's not a mountain of snakes, but if you've been to Chichen, Itz, Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, which is Mayan territory, you will see a Mexican pyramid with huge snake heads at the bottom of the staircases. These, you know, the stairs that go up, dedicated to Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl, feathered snake. So, you know, Quetzalcoatl, one of the, the historical version is he went all the way to the Yucatan to establish a Mexican Mayan city. And he created that Mexican pyramid, dedicated to himself, the snake, the feathered snake. So we think that the K'iche were saying they were dancing around that pyramid. Now, why that pyramid? Because they were basically saying, we follow Quetzalcoatl, and we're just as important as anyone else, and we followed in his footsteps. <coughs> so now we think that's actually the pyramid of Kukulkan. <coughs> Then they hide their idols in anticipation of the coming dawn and the creation of the universe. <clears throat> and my last illustration is the creation of the universe. They're all praising the sun. They only mention two things in the story. Interesting. They don't even mention the moon. They don't mention the stars. There's only two things. The sun and Venus. Venus comes up all the time. All the time. Because, you know, with the Mayan, they call this thing the Mayan Star Wars. Venus had to be in a certain part of the sky in order for them to attack an opposing tribe. They would not attack unless Venus was in a certain area of the sky. That's how important Venus was. It comes up over and over and over. So what do you see in the middle of the sun? This is actually, this upside down sun comes from one of the Diego Rivera murals. It's called the History of Mexico. It's a Mexico City. It's one of the largest murals in the Americas. You should go see it. <coughs> and then I put the glyph of Venus. It wasn't in his mural, but I took it and put it there because that's what they were waiting for, the sun and Venus. And there we have the creation of the universe and uh, the end of my presentation. Did you like them? Good. Thank you very much. Now, for five minutes, questions and comments. Any questions? Any comments? Well, I did see your exhibit at the archive. A minute? <clears throat> I, I, did, I did go and see uh, well, your exhibit at the archive several, and yes, you, you, um, I was taken kind of, I, I, you have just kind of brought it all together because I didn't quite understand you yes. know, what was going on and, and I did find some of them very, very violent, you know, and I was yes. like, yeah. At times it's a very violent story. Right, right. But, but I wanted to be as faithful yeah. to the story as possible. I wanted to exercise fidelity to the story as much That's as possible. That's fascinating and, and yeah, you brought it all together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And by the way, you know, we had this long, I had this long meeting with the Greater Denton Council of Arts. They're very serious about creating a show in 20, I don't know if I should say this now, they, say, they always say, tell artists and writers, don't say anything, you're going to jinx it, but, but it's possible that it would be shown in the fall of 2025 there in Denton. But it did go pop, it did, has gone nationwide, and from what I understand, Nebraska, Wyoming, Kansas has already selected this show to happen in those states, so every artist wants that, to know that the works are going to come back but there's going to be other shows, so I'm very happy about that. Did you have a question, Quentin? Thanks. Yeah, it was, uh, it's more a, a comment, I guess, and that is that uh, this story reminds me of, say, um, ancient Far East Indian uh, creation of, of of the world or yes. or uh, other stories as you mentioned earlier. Yes, and I'm sure they had 
no contact with those other None. civilizations. So it's really interesting that that uh, the the uh, how people think throughout the world. And that's it. Yes, there are parallels. We find parallels, and again, within the story, those are those. There's those archetypal moments that we find in the story that's similar to all great bodies of literature. I think that this should be put into all university and high school curriculums. It's not. Few people know about it, but that's because they, there's a reluctance to put this into the curriculums. I'm, I'm not sure why. But I had a presentation at UNT in Dallas, and they've already decided, I didn't know this, independent of me, to put this in the curriculum, of their curriculum, into their Spanish courses and history courses. So it looks like we're going to collaborate now to, to make that happen. And this, that's, I didn't know that they were, had planned to do that. And they asked me to make the presentation so that they could get their students used to it. I did not know that. Incredible. Yeah, yeah because, you know, Quentin, you have to remember, this is the first time that this work has, been, has come out to the public. It was just known in New York City only, and especially within the university, just these two universities. So I didn't know what kind of response it would get. I'm really happy. So far, it's gotten really positive response. Everyone else, anyone else? I'm sorry. Yes. <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, did you use watercolors? For watercolors this? Yes, and inks. It looks because the, the colors are just brilliant, and I was wondering if I know it's in incredible. Yes. Has anyone seen those uh, those Higgins inks with the little nozzle, and you squeeze and uh, something so simple like that can create uh, incredibly colorful works. I think that all these years of painting these flowers and making something so exact and 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 colorful, you know, the use of different palette, a uh, specific kind of palette, allowed me to do these kinds of work. But you know, before these final illustrations, I, mean, I would do sketch after sketch after sketch. I created like a storyboard, and I would go to the different museums. I'd sketch them out and these little statuettes or whatever. So that's why it took like 10 years mm -hmm. to do yeah. with no government funding, no one helping me, <laughs> and my wife knocking on the door, what have you been doing all day? Go out and get a job. Now you said you went to different uh, places, museums and libraries for your research. Was that all over the country? or No, just, only in New York City. Only in New York City. But New York City has a lot of good museums. You know, they're pretty mm -hmm, good. Yes. They have great collections, very diverse collections. Brooklyn Museum has a big Mesoamerican collection. Yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I didn't have to go anywhere. I, I just took a subway took a ride. Subway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And in fact, after this meeting, this presentation, I'm going to see the director of the Bridwell Library at SMU that specializes in sacred texts. I didn't know that there's libraries throughout the world that specialize just in sacred texts, like the Rittman Library. You should check them out. R-I-T-T-M-A-N in Amsterdam. That's solely dedicated to sacred texts. I got interested in, in that sort of thing because I realized, you know, I think I'm maybe create something like a sacred text, about a sacred text that was burned long ago. When you go to that museum, Irving Archives and Museum, you'll see that I not only did the 65 illustrations, but I did the 65 descriptions of the illustration. So I basically rewrote the story, and then you're gonna hear my voice of the English version of it, because you can click on a QR code and you'll see the descriptions under each illustration. And I just finished the Spanish version as well. It took me five days. I didn't take a shower. I didn't brush my teeth. I didn't shave. All I did was just dedicate myself to make sure that these Spanish uh, translations are done before I come down to Dallas. Hey, I thanks. thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you. I really appreciate it. Let's go over to the, uh, to the drawings now. Okay, I just want to, let me show you this with the color wheel first. And the color wheel. Sorry, how many minute for another question? Oh, sure. Sorry. Sir, uh, thank you. Uh, I, w I want to ask you a couple of things about your illustrations. I'm trying to find the right word for it. Uh, you talked about these pictographs. Mm -hmm. How did you determine that you wanted to illustrate it the way you did? Was that based on any of those pictographs or your concept of art at that time? Or now, remember, 
That book of pictographs was burned in 1524, as far as we know. From what we understand, there is a book of pictographs that were created in 1000 AD by the Quiche Maya, and then burned by the Spaniards when they arrived in this city called Utatlan, that's still there, there today. Um, and they were burned, you know, that same city. Uh, they was burned there, and then they moved their capital, the Quiche, to a place called Chichicastenango. So I never saw the pictographs, to answer your question. So I had to find a way, a contemporary way, a current way of doing it without looking to, how would you say, quaint or, you know, I had to do it in a convincing way, let's say, uh, to, in order to tell the story. So I do know of pictographs, there are pictographs, you can find them online, but not of the Popol Vuh. But there are pictographs of other things, for example, agriculture or Venus or Quetzalcoatl or things like that. So I was conscious of those pictographs, but I, I didn't want to create pictographs that were created 800, 900 years ago. I wanted to make something that's current, that's now, to tell the story. Does that make sense? Well, okay, let me, yes, but for example, the, the imagery, is that based on ancient concepts or pictures, or is that, did you no, d decide that yourself? No, I made artistic decisions along the way. Okay. So I'm, I'm like the, the sole artist and writer of this story. I basically created this, recreated this entire story that you're seeing there of the Popol Vuh. But as faithful as I could make it in terms of the consequential parts of the story. So I didn't fictionalize, I didn't invent something completely different. They're pretty close. If you read the translated text of Racino's Gets in Morning, Morley, Adriano Racino, that I mentioned before, you'll see that it's pretty faithful to the story. But, but the imagery is your own, is that right? Correct. Okay, and one, one, one more thing. Uh, looking at that picture there, and I'm yeah. also looking at this postcard, yes. uh, lots of symmetry. Um, everything seems to be balanced. Yes. Almost like you could fold it in half and, and, and that the opposite is on the other side. Yes. Could you tell us how? Well, that's, there's nothing bad in that. It's, no, it, no. It gets easier to read that way visually. Is it? Yeah, we sure. Okay. In yeah. fact, you know, the visual information, we grasp it much faster than the textual. So you just saw, you just understood basically the entire story with these 65 illustrations. It would take you a much longer time to understand the story by reading, you know, two volumes set by Alan Christensen. Incredible work, incredible accomplishment. But it would take you a while to read that. And you would still have to do more research with it. But you pretty much understood the story through these illustrations, right? Yeah. Yes, Quentin. Oh, talking about the illustrations, uh, some of it reminds me of medieval iconography. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of it reminds me of, say, a children's book. Mm -hmm of illustrations. Yeah, except for the violence. It's pretty violent. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a publisher. And uh, by the way, I'm speaking at Deep Vellum Bookstore at 7 o'clock tomorrow night, if you want to come. And it's a publisher. He happens to be a publisher. And I didn't know of the largest publisher of translated text in the country. I didn't know that. So maybe he'll be the one or someone else. But anyway, please show up. That's one of my hopes is to get it published. So perhaps there's an adult version and a children's version. There you go. Yes. OK, great. Let's get started. So the, I always tell people, my, you know, my students, opposites on the color wheel work. So let me just briefly show you this. The opposite of yellow is purple. And the opposite of blue-green is orange. Like I always tell my students, opposites on the color wheel work. Opposites in marriage don't. But but so you can, you can see that each one vibrates. This, the yellow makes the purple more purple, and the purple makes the yellow more yellow. So if you're learning how to do art, always have. I've had a color wheel in my studio for 30 years now, the same color wheel, to remind me that uh, complementary colors make things so beautiful. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to, uh, let's see. get one of these pencils, and I quickly drew these out just ahead of time so we wouldn't waste too much time. These are the three creatures that are found within the story and, and the, one, the illustrations that I've gone through. 
So I'm just going to quickly do this as a painting demonstration, okay? We don't have too much time left, but I'm going to create this tortuga. El tortuga means, you know, the turtle in Spanish. And I'm going to create the shell now. I've never done this before. This is the first time I've done this. So I'm, I'm a little nervous now. Can you tell that I'm a little nervous? <laughs> this is similar to the turtle that I did for the time that he lost, uh, Hunapu lost his head. La culebra, the snake. And the rattle, we gotta have the rattle. You know, they didn't use any other snakes. They only used the, um, <clears throat> the rattlesnake. There's no cobras in the Americas, you know, that's the Asian snake. But they only used <clears throat> the rattlesnake. Jaguar comes up all the time. So that's why I'm doing the jaguar here. Did you know that gr uh, jaguars do not growl? You know, lions growl. Jaguars kind of like grunt. They're kind of like, oh, oh, oh. Exactly. I slept out in the jungle once years ago, and I heard all kinds of sounds that I'll never do that again because it's, it's really frightening, you know, for a suburban kid from Irving to do something like that. That was scary. <clears throat> And then we got to put some spots on him. So I'm going to do put this in marker in just a moment. And at least I can get the background in. Let's see how far I can go with that, with the time that I have. The, the other name for Jaguar, they call it, is the flowery cat, because it looks like he has flowers on his fur. And he's often, jaguars are often uh, connected with shamanism and magic because jaguars can appear and disappear right in front of you. And warriors too, yes. Okay, now I'm gonna use a marker for, uh, to really make this stand out. First, I'm gonna do the words. I'm going to outline this. <clears throat> this is the fastest I ever drawn drawn a, t a, a turtle. Yeah. 
Yes, in uh, Peru. Yes. Yes. I know, it's incredible what they did with that, right? You have to be careful with them. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be careful. Well, there's like they got pastels, you know. He has to be very, uh, you know, they, they can disintegrate. They, they put them in a dark room so sunlight won't get to them. But none of us will be around by the time those, those drawings deteriorate. So, yes, or prints or something, yes. A culebra, too. Okay. Which eye? This one's hidden. Oh, the other one. Oh, oh this one. Yeah. Like that? Oh, okay. Thank you, Quentin, for showing me that. Okay. Yes. El jaguar. Oh, yes, I've been there for 25 years now, and at the new school. Uh, of Fire and Blood, Art and Mythology of Mexico, and then I teach a course on Mexican muralism and indigenous uh, storytelling and American artists that were influenced by, uh, the, uh, by Native Americans. Uh, does anyone know the major artist that was really influenced by the Mexican muralists? You will be surprised. He was one, he, one of the most famous artists. He died a long time ago. American. White, white American. Anglo. Andy Warhol? Nope. He was obsessed with them. So this is going to be mostly in green. So what's the opposite of green? So I'm going to put red here. See? Red. Okay, I'm going to do it in the background. And then you want to, so let me put this, I'm going to put my smock on. I'm going to do, always do the background first. It's not the object or the figure. It's always the background. Most people do it just the opposite. But you've got to put the background first. This ends at 1.30, correct? Okay. Let's see if I can get most of this done. We have 10 minutes. 12 minutes. Well, I, I got to get it done. I said we could get it done, so let, let's, let's see how far we can get this done. Actually, some of you can even, if you want, you can put the background in with the others if anyone wants to join. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to create the suspense. Um, Jackson Pollock. He was obsessed with the Mexican muralist. Just a what? Very. Well, he actually trained with Thomas Hart Benton. He was a pupil of the great American artist who was, who was also in the tradition of figurative and large murals and such. So he did, he did, yeah. I paint, I, I mean teach, across the hall from the only surviving mural by the Mexican muralist, Jose Clemente Orozco. I teach across the hall from it. It's at the new school. He did it while, when the new school was first created. It was a new building at the time. 
and he did it for free. It's called Table of Brotherhood. You can look it up. It was used for classes for a long time before they realized that they had something really beautiful and priceless. So now they only have very special meetings there. Who was there watching while the mural was being painted? Because his teacher, Thomas Hart Benton, was painting another mural in the basement. Jackson Pollock. He loved Orozco. And when Orozco was painting another one at Dartmouth, a huge mural project at Dartmouth, he hitchhiked all the way up there because he didn't have the money. Okay, beautiful. See how important it is to put the um, to put the Culebra green. So what is the opposite of green? Yeah, red. So I'll make this red. Should I put this red? I think I think I did that wrong. I should have put red inside, right? But anyway, I'll make this green. I'll make it green too. So I'm going to put this as red because this is going to be green. Let me move this over. So I'm going to make that. So I'm going to use red here. So yeah, Jackson Pollock was heavily influenced by, and, and that story is never told until I started teaching it because I have a photograph of Pollock with, with another very famous artist. His name is, his name is Siqueiros, and he loves Siqueiros. So he has, there's a, a not very well-known photograph that someone took and that shows Pollock with his arms around Siqueiros very important, and um, he thought that they were, I'm gonna make this one orange. So then I'm gonna put green on the background. So, but they were, he was so enamored by these Mexican muralists, and they never tell that story until there was a very important show at the Whitney called La Vida Americana. And it shows, it tells the story of how American artists, Anglo artists were so influenced by these Mexican artists. Really incredible. I was so, I love that show because it, it finally revealed these things. That there were more, there was more interaction between the Anglo artists, you know, American artists, and these Mexicans, these Mexican artists. And um, it was quite well done. Okay, now I'm going to do change up here, and I'm going to put green in this background because the Jaguar is going to be orange. You know, I'm going to get this painted a little here. Put a little paint. Is that okay on this on this board? Okay, it's going to come over a little. A little what? Nah. I used to, you know, demonstrate this with my NYU students to do still lifes, and I, I guess I'm sort of used to that when doing it here. But um, you know, I'm kind of used to showing this painting in front of the public. So well, I don't think this has ever been done here, has it, Marcy? Yeah, we have. A, a live painting demonstration? Yes, sir. What? <laughs> I mean, I'm not the first. Sorry. Come <laughs> on. Has a question. Okay. So, so Jaime, so are you 
at the archives, did you do a presentation like this for the children? And how did you? No, I didn't. I didn't have time. Right. Yeah, it... I should, but you know, there's only so much time, and I go. I've, you know, was driving around doing presentations at other places, and and we didn't do anything for children. We just. I thought it was going to happen, but <laughs> that someone was going to reserve time. But mm -hmm. uh, it has not happened. Would you would you modify it a bit? You know how do you, how do you kind I of? I got to come back down. You kind of have to calm it down a little bit, uh, <laughs> maybe. Yes, yeah. I have to find an excuse. Like maybe someone will will show this work again mm -hmm. somewhere here in the in the Dallas area, and I'll come back down. Give me give me a good excuse to come back down, and uh, and do some things. Okay. Now, I'm going to do what's inside. So I'm going to make this orange. Okay, I'm going to use my orange. Good. So smart that I came here yesterday and was able to, and I'll put a little red in it too, to uh, get all of this prepared before and I'm just going to paint, I'm not going to have time to go into the dots. So I'm just going to paint this inside. Always do the background first. And it pops out so fast. Be as loose as possible. Isn't that beautiful? That, see how it pops out? That's just mm -hmm. beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. This could be much more detailed, but for this particular kind of demonstration, is we are going to just do, do it like this. But it's still looking beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love acrylics. Uh, I've been an oil painter all these years until I started doing this. And uh, when I go back, I'm going to create more works using acrylics and inks and watercolors. Much faster. You can be much more expressive. Okay, very good. There's that. Now I'm going to paint this green. Cool. So I'm going to go into this. How much time do we have left? Oh, okay. Are they still out there? Are this the people kind of still out there? I, I can't see. Time and painting, you know, very relaxing. Yeah, you're a very good it's, storyteller. I mean, yeah, you know, thank you. It's very interesting. It's very relaxing to see other people work. You know, and you just <laughs> you just have to sit there and just comment. Let me get a little more green paint. I'm almost done. Another five more minutes. I'm done. So you never came back to us, huh? To Texas. I'm sorry? I said, how come your roots are here in Texas and you you left, huh? For yes. Connecticut and well, there. there were so many things up there. So exciting up there. New York City is such an, an exciting place. As long as you don't get into any trouble, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's so much to do there. And the food, it's the food mm -hmm. that... Uh, is a is just a, well we talked about that right mm -hmm. <clears throat> the food is great a lot of great well there's a lot of good food here too the, really Jersey ah, <coughs> don't let them hear that in New York City oh man. God good pizza up there very good pizza I have to admit very good pizza. My, my daughter loves it, all the pizza. The Korean food, the Japanese food, the Italian food, ah. Oh. And Queens is like foodie paradise. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the driest one and I'm going to sign it. Because you just got to do it. Do you also date it? 2024, yeah. <coughs> Hopefully this is dry enough. And there you go. You did it. <laughs> One thirty on the dot. In fact, I have thirty seconds left. How did that happen? It was all the coffee I drank this morning. Thank you. One thing I noticed that uh, turtle is tortuga. Yes. Uh, snake, I guess. Yes. Is culebra. Yes. But jaguar is jaguar. So we have we have taken the Spanish and used it. That's right. And you know the three hearts of heaven. As far as I know, because the word huracan, I could be wrong. It could be quiche. That could be a quiche word, huracan, which is hurricane. But we use the same word, huracan, in Spanish for hurricane. And cicar, apparently that's a quiche word, it, but it's spelled Z-I-G-A-R, which is cigar. <laughs> See? So there, we take words in English, we take them from a lot of different languages. Right, yeah. Cool, we, right? we incorporate everything from all over the world. That's right. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Excuse me. If the 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 um, the turtle and the snake, using your color wheel, uh, they're the same colors. But if you were to change one, just for addition of this additional colors, what colors would you use to? To differentiate those. So In the background, yeah. I would use more orange. Just make it, for example, maybe around the turtle. So it would be gradated from you know orange closer to the turtle and then going out in a deeper red. I could also go from red here and then gradually get more orange up there, almost as if it were flames, like fire or something, just to give it some variation. And then inside the turtle, I would probably put orange. These things would be orange or yellow. Yeah, same thing here. There could, this could be brown or yellow here. And then I would gradate, gradate the red background. But you see how important it is to first go in with the background and then go into the uh, creature or the figure. Very important. Most people do it just the opposite. They go into the feature and then once they go into the background, they say, oh, now I messed up the background. I did the figure first. Now I got to go back in the background first and then do the. In the it's in reverse order. You got to do the background first. Oh, sure. And especially with the whale, <clears throat> you do layers of color and oil. Yes. And then you let it sit for, I don't know, what, weeks? And then you can. It's really hard. I'm, it's really exhausting work. Oil painting is exhausting. But you get some really beautiful, you can see from that, that looks like an oil painting to me, but you can see that the colors are so vibrant. Yeah. Yes, anyone else? So congratulations that your exhibit's gonna be traveling in the US. Do you know where's the next exhibit? Well, like I said, they just uh, mentioned it. Uh, the director of the museum at a present at when she was up at the podium, she didn't even tell me, she, but she said that it was Nebraska. From what I heard, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. It's a very good thing. Yeah, it's being toured by Exhibits USA, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I did look at the tour schedule. Oh, okay, recently. good. Yeah, I can't tell you. You know, chronologically, which is which. But oh, well, do you know the yeah. states? There's specific well, I mean, it's definitely Kansas City uh, okay. refurbishment um, facility because that's where Mid-America Arts Alliance is, is okay. located, who's touring the show. Okay. Um, yeah, and Wyoming and uh, 
I don't okay. know. I have to look at it again, okay, but Wyoming. it's filling okay, up, and it'll be on tour for the next two to three years, I believe. At least, yes. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? That's a great thing. So I'm, I'm so happy. As an artist, you always want that sort of thing. And this is the first stop. Is this, your first stop? this was the first stop. Can you believe it, it was Irving, Texas? This is. It came out of New York City. This is why I said this is the first time it came out of New York City. So I don't. I didn't know what kind of response it would get. So so far, it's been just great. Everywhere I've gone, people love the story, people love the illustrations, they love my story. Do you have a website? Uh, yes. In fact, I'm going to give you some cards that have a QR code. I hate QR codes, but you know, it had to happen that you could make a business card and put the QR code on the back, but that you can just click on it and go and see you know, my Instagram accounts and my website. So I'm creating another website just for the Popol Vuh. That's what I was asking. And I've cre I'm now in the process of creating uh, two other projects, one that's called Sisters of the Underworld. Instead of two male hero twins, it's two female hero twins, and it takes place in New York City, and the subway system is Shibalba, the underworld. So I've already finished it, more or less, at, at 43,000 words, which is a lot. So it has basically the entire stories there. But I have to go back in and muscle it up, give it some more muscle. And I illustrated already to it, so it's like a graphic novel. It's at 111 panels. So that it took me a, a lot of work. And then I'm going to create another project called Lufkin, Texas, Too Brown to be Buried. Uh, I have, I didn't know this until my father died about six years ago, but my aunt, who was a retired nun, brought out this photo, this old black and white photo. She said, this is your great-grandfather, great-grandmother, and your grandmother, my father's mother, and this is her sister, my grandmother's sister. She was only 12 years old at the time. And she got too close to an outside fire, burned her entire dress, and burned most of her body. This is in 1923, right after the revolution. They went to Lufkin, Texas to work on the railroads. So she was a beautiful little girl. She was probably just you know two years younger than my own daughter. Well, she lay dying for about two months. It, no medicine was given to her, and someone came that they said was a doctor, and he bandaged her up. But when they took off the bandage, you know, burn victims, you have to be very careful when you take them off, the, her flesh would come off. And so she lay dying in this, um, on this little bed in the little shack. She died after two months. So they took her to a local cemetery, uh, to see if they would bury her in Lufkin, Texas. And they said, we do not bury Mexicans in our wow. cemetery. So they said, well, what do we do with her? And they said, we don't know. We don't care, care. But this is an all-white cemetery. So they buried her by the side of the road in Lufkin, Texas. And they went to Corsicana that day. They were so horrified by this. So my great-grandfather had to bury his own daughter next to the side of the road. I you know, present this photo to all my students every semester to tell them, you know, Jim Crow was a horrible thing, especially in East Texas. It wasn't directed just towards black people. It was also Mexicans that were involved in this. And one of the students came, and they said, Professor, Professor, did you know that in South Texas, they still don't bury Mexicans and black people in white cemetery? It's still segregated. I said, what? This is great. He sent me the link, and someone had done a journalist uh, report on it, and it's the case still today. Not in all of them, but it's still the case, probably in smaller towns. So anyway, I'm going to illustrate to it and write it just as I did the Popol Vuh. So those are two projects that you're going to see when you on the QR code, and then I'm creating a website just for that in Popol Vuh and these two projects. The story has to be told. This is part of the American experience. We all come with these very complicated stories. Hey, I, you know, I thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I want Thanks. to.